Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. We're here for part two with the beautiful Claire Headley from the the Scient the ex Scientology gang, the SPTV, um, which to me is one of the most fabulous things about YouTube in this modern times is all all y'all as we say down here in the south all y'all and the work that you guys are doing together and the inspiration that you're bringing so many people especially for the most part it seems as you said last time the never ends like yes. people like myself like how much inspiration that your story is bringing to so many people um across the world and before we get into it guys i just want to go ahead and once again, I'm going to share screen here quickly. If you are not subscribed to Claire and Mark's channel, Blown for Good, Scientology Exposed, we're going to be talking about this great series today about Shelly Miscavige, which uh, Claire, you and I, before we started filming, we're laughing about true crime, which is not what you guys <laughs> think it is. But before we got into that, I got a lot of emails with questions, and there's some questions I kind of want to hold off on for a little bit because I think they kind of deserve their own like the whole bridge thing and the pricing and the nonprofit and the you know all, how all that works I feel like that stuff could probably be its own episode Agreed. but there was one question and I appreciate all the feedback that we got about going through the theology of Scientology and comparing it to where it came from which is the eastern philosophy we talk I'll put the link if you guys missed the last episode in the description box below we talked about surge and how, if you guys missed that documentary, how, um, you, I guess you guys call it the calling in, like karma, like things. Oh, uh, pulling it in. It's called pulling it in. It's called, uh, or over motivator sequence. It's the same. Basically, any, anything that, anything bad or negative that happens in your life is caused by you. It's a consequence of some, which, yeah, which, yeah. I, and I said to, to Claire, if you guys, I'm not, I don't like sniffs. If you have not seen the documentary again, I'll put that in the description box too. When I watched the story of Surge and what had happened to him, for me as somebody who has studied, been to India and spent many years studying this, my perspective is that the karma that Surge was learning in this life, the refinement of his soul was learning how to accept love, unconditional love, which is a very different perspective than what it looks like Hubbard tried to create, which if you're looking at it from that perspective, then there is no mind control, right? If it's right. all about refining your soul and receiving love and how to be, you know, that's the thing about unconditional love. It's not just giving it, but it's also learning how to receive it too. And that was very obvious to me by watching that story that that, if I had to guess that that was what he was learning was how to receive love. Uh, um, yeah. Obviously he can give it. I mean, you see by hearing him talk, he's a very loving person. Totally. And I had a question. I talked to you about this off camera and I'm going to let you kind of, again, I had somebody email me and wanted me to address the way that Scientology views children. Yes. And I think a lot of that has to do with the concept of reincarnation and how Eastern philosophy would view this. So I'm going to let you, Claire, take it. How does Scientology view children? Yes, sounds good. So first of all, um, oh, and, and by the way, let me just add a comment because I don't want to forget it. And and I think it's important on the, the whole thing we were just talking about, about karma. In Scientology, the overt motivator sequence, the, pull, the whole pulling it in concept is so much about control um and because the policy in scientology the specifically and directly i mean there's many others but one of the primary ones is called blow-offs in which um hubbard says oh the only reason anyone ever leaves scientology is because they've committed crimes they've done they've committed transgressions and that's the reason for the title for our channel blown for good if you're, you know, unauthorized departure. Anyway, it's just interesting that it's as much about um, control and leverage as making you do the work of keeping yourself in it. Because of course, if you're thinking about, oh, I don't want to be here anymore. And then the programming kicks in of like, oh, I must have done bad things because this is why I'm wanting to leave. Then you're doing your own mental work to keep yourself in the indoctrination in the group. And anyway, and that's, so, that's so abusive like that's such a sign and yeah karma from the eastern perspective guys all karma is is cause and effect and everything about being in a natural body is 
here you're here to refine your soul and so everything that happens to you in your life it's not meant to punish you it's not meant to be because you're a terrible person it's all about a it's a creating a friction and i always i always use it this way so like i could say looking and just from what i know of claire and mark you guys went through this horrific experience in scientology and this would have been what we would have called probably a dharmic where your soul absolutely agreed to have this experience experience but what happened was you decided your soul also had this moment of deciding to leave and so what happened in that moment was you had what we call a prativa which is a flash of illumination and in that moment of friction because listen y'all if y'all have not heard the story of them leaving that was a massive friction for them i mean we talked about it a little bit last week with you sitting on your purse if you think about a match with when you have a match the match has everything it needs to light but it cannot light itself unless it's struck against the matchbook it's like the more your heart breaks the more the light can shine through and so what we're seeing with all you guys from sbtv is that you agreed to go through this really horrific experience to then be able to take that friction and that light to express more love more compassion more empathy more guidance for mankind and so that's the bigger picture of a lot of what the eastern philosophy when you can view your life in at least for me in my own life view things in that perspective of where is that friction where is that mm -hmm. that action where is this allowing me a trajectory to not only get to know myself in a deeper level but be of service to others too then all of a sudden these things stop becoming so powerful if that makes sense yeah yeah i so the only part about what you just said that causes friction is, <laughs> is the i don't know that i can accept that i accepted that to happen i do agree i do accept it yeah i just don't i just don't know that i accepted it beforehand <laughs> i only my friend oh, I, have a, I have a friend named tamara she's a, a big uh a chart reader from australia like lionel yeah. richie all these people and she's hysterical because she'll sit there and say man we we must have been real bored to decide to come to earth during this time <laughs> really bored up there in the cosmos to be like uh, go to planet earth at this time <laughs> yeah it's it's um it's definitely it's a lot and that's where the complexity start to play into with the eastern philosophy as well yeah and that's the one thing too though i i just want everybody to, to that, that any type of karma or that you're learning in any type of religion it's not supposed to control you it's just supposed to be a, a, a way of refining your soul. And that's yeah. it. And so if, if anybody is using that to try to control you, whether it's a religion or an abusive relationship, like that's a red flag. You know, you, you, you're, you're a sovereign fractal of God. You're a human being and you don't deserve to be treated uh, in that manner at all. So with yeah. that being said, though, what is their perspective on kids? What is yes. the <laughs> idea they have with children? <laughs> yeah. So, so first of all, I think it's important just to cover the fact that in really basic terms, Scientology believes that you, you, you yourself are a Thetan, which is, you know, a spiritual being and that you have, you have a body and, um, but the Thetan is, um, uh, has no beginning and end, you know, it just is. And so it's a, I, and my understanding is it's different. It's a different concept than reincarnation. Um, but essentially as a, as a Thetan, you, you go and pick up a body is what the, a Scientologist will tell you. And you're now in that body and that's your, you know, physical, you know, physical, uh, presentation in this world that we live in called the physical universe and Scientology. Um, and then when you get to the, when the body reaches the end of its life cycle and dies, then you, the Thetan, go and pick up a new body. So, and um, some of the complexities is, you know, Hubbard says, oh, in between lives, you go and get implanted to believe that you're just you're just in you know the you only live you only live once concept basically but in all for all intents and purposes you've lived many 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 lifetimes on the whole track as he refers to it um and you've you know you've been good you've been bad you've been woman you've been male you've been everything um so then that then leads into hubbard's approach to children which is that um children are adults in small bodies um like i pulled up this 
one quote that somebody sent me from 1968 where Hubbard says, a thetan is simply a thetan. Body size has nothing to do with it. The trouble with, quote, children, unquote, is that it is a generality. Quote, that's the way children are, unquote. A suppressive is a suppressive, whether he is big or small. Um, anyway, so you get the idea that, you know, a suppressive person can, he, Hubbard would consider a child a suppressive person, uh, meaning they're antisocial, bent on the destruction of all humankind. Um, but again, the point being that you, children are treated as adults in small bodies and, um, and that, and, and also, specific to the C organization, their motto is we come back. So it's very often kind of um, approached with Scientology children, like, oh, you've come back. You were a, a Scientologist in a previous life, and that's why you've you've ma made it back. And now you need to resume your billion years of service, you know, type of approach. So I will answer this. So Eastern philosophy would absolutely say, no, you do not treat children like adults, even though in Eastern philosophy, it is taught that you do reincarnate. Now, this is why in Eastern philosophy, if you, especially if you're looking at the Yoga Sutras, which is a 5,000 year old text, there's three players involved in your, you can call it the Trinity in your being. And that is Ishvara. So that is a Sanskrit word for God or higher consciousness, Prakriti, which is nature, and Purusha. Purusha is the soul. And so Ishvara and Purusha are the two sides of you that are, are eternal, that are never ending, that you can't kill a soul. It's, it's something we even as human beings can't fathom. But Prakriti, because it's nature, it, it goes on a birth and life and a death cycle. And because of that, it's always changing, right? There's always change happening. And uh, Patanjali's uh, theory was that man suffers there's the human conditioning because man forgets that he, he thinks he's his body he thinks is his identity but he's actually a soul and it goes a little bit deeper than that because we have the shiva and the shakti which is another name for the soul and the body the shakti is the body which is the expression of the soul so your natural body is the expression of your soul in action but with that being said your identity and the life that you're in now plays no bearing on past lives. Mm -hmm. There might be a, a, a energy coming, like a lesson to that you, there are a refinement coming from a past life, but you're experiencing in the in the identity that you are now. So like when people in, in my line of work try to talk to me about their past lives, I don't want to hear it. I'm interested in what you're doing now because that's where you are. Is you, Right now, I am Bryce. This is the experience of me right now. So with a child, if you have a with the natural body so the soul might be millions of billions of light years old or whatever um what i heard someone uh was it really saying the ice cubes floating in the ocean right like you might you, you know you could have been, you could have been who knows yeah yeah that doesn't matter that doesn't matter because right now your five-year-old is your five-year-old and the organs of the body of the natural body are not millions and billion years old right. my cognitive brain is 40 years old a right. five-year-old's brain is five. And the innocence of a child, it doesn't matter what they did in a past existence. Right. The innocence of a child should be preserved at all costs because that is the experience of the now. And it's all got to come from a place of love and children deserve to be protected. And even within the yoga practices, the traditional practices, they do not let children practice because they t they'll tell uh, for girls, girls can start practicing at like 12, um, roughly boys 14 because they admit girls mature faster than boys. <laughs> so, um, but they, they say it because it's too serious. They don't want children to, 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 they want, you know, my teacher in India will say, if your kid wants to practice with you, play yoga with them, just play with them. Don't, don't subject them to something that's more, more complex in thought than where they are at five, six, seven years old. At yeah. five, six, seven years old, they should be playing Barbies. They should be playing Legos. They should be enjoying that imagine. And also in the Eastern philosophy, they don't, when you're picking up a body, as you guys say, so remember I said the body is the Shakti of the soul. So when you decide to come back to earth for whatever reason, you've already picked your parents. You've already picked the body that's in the womb. 
So the soul comes in through this third eye area into the body after it's created it right and so there's no just hopping around for body but like like night of the living dead like the zombie apocalypse, you know it's it's a very thought out process of your soul um yeah. for the experience and you pick the experience so you pick like the race the gender whatever you feel like you need to experience for whatever refinement but in this moment absolutely children should be protected at all cost um they should not be subjected to you would not give a five-year-old a key to your car and say like you know you're a race car driver in a past life go drive my car to the grocery store yeah <laughs> you you got this right you got it we right. you got, you got this, this covered <laughs> yeah and actually in scientology um six a six-year-old is the age that hubbard says yeah start start giving them counseling that's actually the ideal around there uh i think is the was his ideal age to start training kids as messengers for him and messenger is a, a a position in the sea organization. It was traditionally on the on the ship, the Apollo, when the sea organization was formed at sea. Messengers would run messages for L. Ron Hubbard, but a uh, presuming assuming his beingness, like delivering the message as he would say it, with the tone he would say it, like you know that was. Uh, yeah. A lot of responsibility for a, a six-year-old should be playing with Barbies, playing with Legos. Six-year-old little girls aren't even shaving their legs yet. Like th right. this is, you know, it's it's heartbreaking. And and so if anybody's watching, if you're the person that asked that question, if you were subjected to this as a child, I am so sorry you went through that. You did not deserve that. Um, anybody watching that was put in that position of having to be an adult before they were cognitively ready to be an adult. I mean, there's a reason why children aren't doing surgeries you know like the, if you think about this in common sense there's 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 um cognitive understanding and the brain develops the physical brain which is the muscle that problem solves for the body develops at certain ages and that's why yeah. small children don't wonder where babies come from because they don't even that's not even you know a thought that's not even they're not ready for that so for anybody out there watching that went through a manipulation of re whether it was with Scientology or another faith with this whole idea of reincarnation or being a Satan or whatever that is, if that was manipulated for you, I am so, so sorry. And you did not deserve as a child, you deserve to be protected. And yeah. I, you know, and that's, that's, that's very, the, 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 the military, the United States military doesn't have six year olds. <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. And and ironically, I will say in all sincerity that when I had when I had my kids, when I escaped and I had kids, that started the process for me of walking back the trauma and abuse of my childhood because even to the even to the moment that I had kids of my own, I was I just hadn't even evaluated it. I hadn't even thought about it. I barely even talked to Mark about it cuz hey, why talk about super dark experiences and anyway you know the programming of scientology like uh best to, if you don't have anything good to say don't say anything at all is their approach you know <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like some southern mothers i know <laughs> just shut up <laughs> so yeah you know no so, even claire you deserved claire you deserved a childhood you deserved to be a little girl an innocent little girl playing outside um, I can't even just from what I've heard from you guys, the responsibility that's put on your shoulders at a very young age, and especially this idea of clearing the planet when you're six, like seven, right. eight, that's not, that should not be your responsibility. And so <laughs> on behalf of all the children that have ever were not protected, that's a trauma. And I want to acknowledge that for everybody that you, you deserve protection. And, um, and so, um, so yeah, I'm going to get emotional now. So we're going to go. Oh, I appreciate it. I am too. I'm, I'm like, hold it back. Hold it back. I have pockets come out of nowhere. <laughs> I'm always like, I need my waterproof mascara. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, when my, I remember my mother saying that when we were little, we we're really little, she would say it to us all the time to my, my siblings, like, you will never understand there's nothing you can do that would stop me from loving you. That parental love is so just raw. And I remember when I held my nephew for the first time when after he was born and holding that, the kid that made me an aunt and feeling that, like I would absolutely take a bullet for this child and if yeah. anybody ever touched him. And so I want to express that love to children that didn't receive that. And I want to say, I would imagine with things like Scientology, your parents were also victims 
of mind control as well. And so you deserved love, you deserved protection. And so please, please, please do not let anybody ever take that away from you. That is not, that is not the basis of spirituality. Spirituality is about liberation of soul, not yeah. control. And so, um, so yeah. All right. Before and, we get and, and, but just to add one last comment, I appreciate what you just said. I, and I would say that that one factor to me illuminates the danger of Scientology more than anything else like how scientology somehow has managed to break that most basic of bonds to where you know parents or children you know that basic foundational love that makes you who you are and is part of your your soul they've managed to break that it's horrific and i i mean part of me thinks can i get like a, a psych i, I told Claire off, off camera that I want to do a big round table with a bunch of people from different cult women, especially I'm like, can I get a psychiatrist on here to like talk about like how this happens, like how this happens. And I can't, I mean, I, even just as an aunt, I would go to the ends of the earth for my nephew and my nieces. There is nothing those children could do that would stop me from ever wanting to they always have a home with me they are even i mean i know my sister as well but you know they they have so many people and that's the one thing i've always been grateful for no matter what happens in my life i know i have family i know i have people that will shelter me and yes. that is horrific from what's happening with with and that's not just scientology there are other cults that are also doing it as well and the mental gymnastics and abuse that has to happen to get some because it's not like the first day you walk in and they're like if you mess up, if you walk away, we're going to take your family. But they don't tell you that on the no. <laughs> introduction course, do they? <laughs> no, it's not on the warning signs when you walk in the door. You know, just be prepared that you may never speak to your mother ever again. You're like, what? <laughs> that's that's not, not part of the uh, here's your sign routine. <laughs> so I take these psychopaths, you know, they're not stupid and they have patience and they will whittle you down to the point where you are totally, um, totally just hoodwinked. And, and it's, 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 but, you know, thank God you and Mark have, have course corrected for your children and your children will not, and your future grandbabies and their, their children, they'll never know that, you know, because you and Mark made that decision and that's huge. It's a huge course correction. And so that's very admirable. So, all right, guys, before we start crying, and I'm <laughs> right now, so I'm going to cry anyway. <laughs> but, um, um, my boobs are sore. I've been snacking all day. But, <laughs> but speaking of another fellow female, um, there has been this, again, this like this cultural phenomenon about Shelly Miscavige. And I've, I've been watching your series. I mean, we were talking about true crime. It's, 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 there's this mystery and it's, can we just start from the beginning? Cause it's not what, what us normies, us people that aren't in a cult would suspect when people go, where is Shelly? I mean, does Shelly Miscavige even know that she's freaking famous at this point? You know, <laughs> I'm willing to bet money. Shelly has no idea. I yeah. mean, so, so let's 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 walk it back from the beginning. So, who is Shelley Miscavige, Claire? Who is this this woman? Yes, Shelley Miscavige is. Um, she was born Michelle Diane Barnett in Texas, um, and she is one of th originally one of three sisters. She w she is the middle sister um, to uh, Flo Barnett and Barney Barnett. And um, the family got into Scientology full on, head on, hardcore in the 60s. Um, <clears throat> yes, there we go. Oh, look at you. <laughs> I was like, I'm just gonna pull. She's a beautiful woman. Look at her. She is. Okay. Yeah, no, she she is. Um, and, and she, whereas her husband is a narcissistic psychopath, I would classify Shelly as a kind, empathetic person with a traumatic childhood who is a victim of circumstance. Do I say that that means she's, she's never done anything or witnessed abuse or, you know, com um, contributed to David Miscavige's bizarre circumstance of complete, absolute authoritarian power? No, I don't. But... Um, so, so taking a step back for a second, um, I attribute, um, I'm super respect to Leah Remini for, you know, she left Scientology in 2013 and where many high profile, um, celebrities have 
interacted or had knowledge of Scientology and just walked away, like Laura Prepon and, you know, whatever, other people. Uh, Leah could have done that. She could have just walked away. Um, instead, she publicly left, filed a missing person report on Shelly, who was a friend of hers for many years. And she completely changed through through that action. And then subsequently, Leah Remini, Scientology in the Aftermath, subsequently the Fair Game podcast. It is my personal opinion that Leah and Mike Rinder have almost single-handedly changed the rhetoric in regards to the public perception of Scientology. And I say that even as like Mark and I had participated in several documentaries before the release of Going Clear and Scientology in the Aftermath. And, you know, it was kind of like it it was portrayed as like, oh, it's this dark, funky thing that we don't really know much about, but not on a broad platform and not in a way that you know, hey, the, these are real people. This is their real life stories. This is what happened to them. And this is what the organization of Scientology does. Um, so that's where the Aftermath show was incredible. Even personally, prior to that, if I would mention, you know, out here in the middle of Colorado, like, oh, have you heard of Scientology? And there would be people would commonly say, oh, that's that crazy thing that Tom Cruise does where he jumps up on down on jumps up and down on couches. You know, we all remember that, right? Um, instead, it's become no, <laughs> it's a really destructive, abusive, controlling organization that actually systematically destroys people's lives. And the exposure that going clear uh, with Lawrence Wright's book and the and then the HBO documentary and then Leah Remini Scientology in the aftermath, et cetera, it just has made it broadly understood to you know, real people out here in the real world, that this is a destructive organization. And so prior, so, and also it just shone an incredibly bright light where before Scientology could get away with pretty much anything, you know, nobody asked, nobody knew, you know, <laughs> it's not like, um, it, it was just, it just lack of information. So that has very dramatically changed with the missing person report filed on Shelly. And so, so backing up for a second, um, I talked about that I worked in Religious Technology Center for eight years, which is the organization run by David and Shelly Miscavige. Um, <clears throat> Shelly for four years ran me directly as, as my boss. Like I would meet with her in the morning be like, here's the list of what I'm going to get done today. You know, I, I just worked very closely with her. I, I, she was, of course, senior to me, and I had great respect for her, but I also considered her a mentor and somebody I looked up to and somebody that I knew had personal knowledge of having worked with L. Ron Hubbard for, she, she actually worked with him from the age of uh, approximately 11 or 12. Um, yeah. And so you, it's that that makes sense because even in like the real the real world, even in the whatever that means in the normie world, when you work for someone for a long time, you develop a personal relationship with your that person. You become, you know, your your coworkers can in a lot of ways become like family. And so there is a personal investment for you. And Shelly Miscavige is um, David Miscavige is the one that took over from L. Ron Hubbard, so she would be like the first lady of Scientology, correct? Yes, that's right. So Hubbard died in, I think, January 86. And um, David Miscavige carefully manipulated himself into power. He removed all other players. And so at that point, he became number one. And Shelley, as his assistant and as his wife, was number two. And that's how it was from, uh, you know, 1987 until um, mid-2006. So 1987 until mid 2006, Shelley was at David Miscavige's side day and night, witnessed everything, was at every meeting he ever held. You know, uh, <clears throat> she ran his office, she ran his just everything. And obviously she was also his wife. Um, but that's where, and, and that also struck me like, first of all, this question, where is Shelley? We know where Shelley is. She's being held captive at a secure, highly secure compound in California in Running Springs. 
But the reason to keep asking the question is because how can it be in this day and age, in this country, that a woman can be held captive, not seen in public for 18 years, not not seen or heard from by her own family, and yet nobody asks questions? And this is a tax-exempt organization that is alleging to be a religion that's trying to lure in innocent people. I mean, what in the world? Seriously. <laughs> that's what gets me too, Claire, because i that's one another episode I want to do with you is a whole tax exemption thing. And we know that all religions have had have shady past. We know that there's been very, but as of late, a lot of religions are having to be held accountable for stuff they've done why is it scientology right great question as a never end as somebody who doesn't even claim a religion i'm just a spiritual just trying to be a good human i'm saying why isn't scientology be now can scientology this is a question i have too now i know with nonprofits, so 501c3s there's different forms of nonprofit, and i know for a lot of nonprofits, they can also get grants from the government can, can which you guys when you get a grant from the government that's not the biden administration sending you a check that's taxpayer money that's being sent and if it's the aftermath foundation if like the aftermath gets a twenty five thousand dollar grant from the government cool i think most people would be very supportive of yep. an organization like the aftermath foundation using taxpayer money to help people escape these horrific you know so they they'll i don't know if religions are the same if religions can get grants or not through their nonprofit. but if they can not only are they taking money from their their parishioners that's not being taxed but there's a possibility that they could in all likelihood also apply to get your money as a taxpayer from what i understand and so that's why it's even for the never ends there should be questions like what the hell is happening with right this religion and why is this woman being now why do you declare why in what marriage i mean we were talking about this off camera you and i both watch a lot of true crime <laughs> we see we see usually when someone goes missing the spouse is the first main suspect you know? completely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> why would david miscavige because i believe you are correct i've never met david miscavige but from what i see he looks like a psychotic narcissist from the stories I've heard from you guys, which I believe all of you guys, he looks like a psychotic narcissist. So Shelly, in all, for all likelihood, is his better half. It's his right. the shining point of who he is in his life. Why would he hide her away? What husband hides away a wife like that? What is he? What is he? Why is he putting her away? Right. So first of all, there. So I have a few different working theories on that from my own personal experiences and observations. Number one, I think the primary reason is that Shelley had the audacity to question him, go against him, disapprove of his intensely close relationship with Tom Cruise. And, um, and, you know, she, so Shelley told me personally in September or roughly September 2004 that she was working on the project to find Tom Cruise a wife, for example. That was while I was still there, even though that project didn't finish up until after I had escaped, resulting in Katie Holmes, and we all know how that went. Um, but so Shelly, her view was that, you know, she she was a, she is a hardcore loyal Scientologist. So the indoctrination for her, there's no question, runs incredibly deep. I, it's my understanding that she considered Hubbard more like a father figure. You have to understand too, it's not just that she worked from him for him from the age of 11. It's also that she was sent away from her parents. Uh, so, sh so she was in that environment 24 seven from the age of 11, 12 ish with no contact to the outside world, no contact to her family, no contact to her mom and dad, you know, none of that. It's not like she was spending Christmases with her mom and dad even, you know, she was just gone, poof. So this is her survival too. Like this is her her way of, of, of being a human. Like this is literally all she knows. That's right, yep. And so I only say that because it's just important to understand that she, worked way closer with Hubbard than David Miscavige ever did. And because of that, 
she has way more um she she's just way more respected and looked up to and uh, you know, by all the top executives in Scientology. If you ask anyone who worked at that property who was a top executive what their emotion was in relation to David Miscavige, I guarantee it's fear. Uh, you know, fear. Fear was the primary driving emotion that David Miscavige ran that the headquarters with. S Shelley, yes, she was, she mirrored that fear by virtue of being so close to David Miscavige, but also she tried to make things better. She tried to improve things. She, if, if David Miscavige would beat somebody up, for example, she would make sure that that person was okay and see that they got some medical attention afterwards while David Miscavige was not looking, you know, that kind of thing. So she, she had humanity and um, so at least some compassion and some, um, uh, control, well, uh, yeah, some influence over the executive. She just didn't exert that. And I, I'm personally of the opinion that she probably started to, and that, and David Miscavige shut that down. So in terms of timeline, I escaped in January, 2005. And, um, so maybe it was mid 2000. It's, it's either mid 2005, mid 2006, when she vanished completely. Um, and then it got even worse next level after the Vanity Fair article in 2014, approximately. Um, like there was some little snippets of sightings or communication with her family or whatever, but after that, nothing. So, you know, and again, you have to, I, I consider having lived in that world and knowing full well that I could have been locked up equally like to that level. And, and if I were in that position, there's no way in 18 years, I wouldn't have thought for just a moment, like what, maybe I should get the heck, try and get the heck out of here. I'm in and prison. I, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. When you're in prison, even, even with many years of indoctrination, still the cracks start would start to show oh absolutely yeah. there's only so much the uh human psyche can take when they're put in that much isolation and i mean my so claire let's just say like let's say like many many years go by and she's still not seen from is there a possibility that she could pass away and no one would know very definitely unfortunately and even um, her, does she have family still alive like siblings yeah and yeah, so she has she has an older sister, Clarice, who is still um, a Sea Org member, a staff member working at the Golden Era Productions or the, you know, the headquarters in Gilman Hot Springs. And so Gilman Hot Springs, so there's one sister there and Running Springs is about an hour, hour and a half from that property. It's much smaller and it's much more secure and there's way less staff working there. I think to my knowledge is only about 15 or 20 people they're working now best case scenario and of that at least three of them are full-time handlers for shelly miscavige i was going to ask you that is there ever a time when she's alone no that's absolutely not somebody's nerves too yeah if you're exactly being handled. yeah and and another piece that i've just learned about recently that um so my my interactions with shelly uh, were all, always kind of included her dogs. She had um, at one point up to I think five beagles that were super close to her. They were they were essentially like her kids, like Lucy. There was Jelly. There was anyway, whatever. <laughs> I can't remember the names of all the other ones, but um, they were they meant everything to her. And I recently heard from somebody that I that I trust that. Uh, when she was sent to the Running Springs property, she was not allowed to take her dogs with her, which is just really, really, really shitty. I had, I had kind of assumed that, oh, well, Shelly would only go along with something like that if she was allowed to take those dogs with her. And anyway, it seems like a really, it That's might just, seem like a minor cute. point, but it's, yeah, so it's I'm really... I'm a dog owner. We rescue dogs in India. And Catherine Edwards, who you also film with, she has a little animal sanctuary in her house as well. 
when you have a relationship with a pet and I can even call them pets, you know, the speaking of, we've been talking a lot about Hawaii because of Maui, there's a word that the Hawaiians use for dog owners and it's called kahu. You're your dog's kahu, meaning that you are the protector of their soul, you know? And so that, I think dog owners take that very seriously that, that, and so that, that makes you want to cry like that she would have that taken from, I mean, you son of a bitch, David Miscavige, you son I of know. a like, you, I know you you're gonna walk your wife away she, with hand I mean I know I heard you refer to it once as a buddy I'm like that's a real nice way to call someone a handler because they're basically being handled you are she's a grown-ass woman who has yeah. a right to privacy and a right to have a voice and and to love people and to see people and now she's being monitored just right. for simply probably just for just speaking up or being who having that upper hand or her husband because she did have she did know hubbard you know not saying hubbard was the same either but no definitely oh. not no but but in terms of controlling if you look at how david miscavige so carefully and manipulatively removed every other key player every other person who had ever been close to hubbard he moved them off the board and so it in retrospect, I look at it and go, of course, it was inevitable that Shelly would be in the firing line. I It just never would have occurred to me in a million years when I was there that it would get to that point. You know, if I think back on like what impact would it ha have had on me as a top executive at that property if I had been there when Shelly had vanished off the lines? Like, it wasn't just that she stopped being seen. You have to understand, like she was copied on every single piece of communication from David Miscavige. She was at every meeting. She was just like, poof, like gone. she existed to begin with. Just yes, gone. she's not cc'd on anything. It's just like poof. And if I put myself in m my shoes that I wore at that property and consider for just a moment the h massive impact it would have had on me to ha to have that happen while I was there. It's just shocking. I just go, it, it most likely is as much about uh, showing everybody there that nobody is exempt from his wrath as it is about his wrath for Shelley. What is what a tiny, small, little son of a bitch you are, David Miscavige. And how ironic is it, though, Claire, that the whole world, it seems like, now cares about Shelly. Right. And I, I hope that one day, I mean, I, I, I don't know. We, no one knows. I don't know why. I mean, I understand that law enforcement does have boundaries. Like, I understand that. I get that there are certain laws that they have to abide by. Um, but at some point... I just, and maybe that's why I'm not in the police force. I don't know. It's some, and there's some weird relationship between Scientology and the police. Is, am I correct in saying that? Yep. Some, like interesting. Yep. Not, not all of them. Um, I will say that I've done a lot of behind the scenes work and that I know there are some very good people in law enforcement. Like I will never, I will always bring up anytime I talk about law enforcement, let's not forget that yeah. when Mark was escaping and he was run off the road and somebody called 911, the Riverside County Sheriff's Office responded and they are honestly the only reason I'm here today. So, you know, I, I mean, I've told them that to their face, not without crying, but you know, you just go, I know there are good people and I know that there are, that law enforcement is doing what they can and I know they're working to get better and more effective in understanding this bizarre situation that we have that we're faced with where where also what plays into it is Scientology now has amassed billions of dollars so if with that uh resource at their fingertips of course they're going to use all that money to protect themselves to the ends of the earth and it seems like pro by protecting themselves, it's David Miscavige who's protecting himself because you're right. There is no, as somebody who is a never end, I would be very shocked if any just public person walked into a, an org and started taking classes at this point because every person knows. Um, and you're right. You got, and it's not just, yeah, you know, I know Leah Remini has the big presence because she is the actor and all that kind of stuff, but you guys are a part of that too, Claire. Like you guys are a part of that every, you know, if it was just the, the aftermath show or 
just this one documentary here, then it might have fizzled out. But you guys getting getting up every day and being on YouTube and, and putting it out there are part of that machine that helps people like myself. You know, for someone like me who's always questioned why we're here and God gets into like studying. If I had, if, if it had not been for people like you, there's a possibility I could have walked into a Scientology org and been like, oh, you have the answers to life, you know? But because we have this beautiful YouTube and this SBTV, you would have to be living under a rock to, <laughs> to not know that this, you know, I've been to Clearwater a couple of times. It's a ghost town, y'all. <laughs> you know? It's, um, it's, yeah. So, you know, that's that's the only thing I feel like David Miscavige has is the money at this right. point, um, yep. to protect himself for the most yep. part because Yeah, and, and that is the the beauty of the the YouTube platform and I full credit to Aaron Smith Levin growing up in Scientology. Um, you know, I, I Mark and I were just kinda like, uh, oh, you know, we have our day jobs, you know, and he kind of encouraged us to be like, No, seriously, it's a great platform. You know, because yeah, the, you have to factor in too. Unfiltered voices has a very different impact on a person than a glossy show where it's you know presented. And you know, everybody, anyone that you talk to that was on the aftermath show, will tell you that that what was what ended up on the show is just a tiny little sliver of their story, and that's just the nature of that platform. So that is the beauty, and I love that there are more and more people joining SPTV network nation, whatever you want to call it every day. And, you know, it is strength in numbers and it is also, you know, the, the strength of the light being shone on Scientology is something that they cannot hide away from any longer. No. And that's the whole thing I was saying, the more your heart breaks, the more the light can shine through. And you guys have really, you've gone through more heartbreak and I've gone back and rewatched. I watched the, 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 the documentary, the program aftermath when it came out, I watched it. And then I went back and rewatched it when, when you guys, and especially when I got contact with you and Mark, I went back and rewatched it. And I saw, I sobbed in y'all's episodes again, but you're right. And of course, companies like a and e like these big networks they have a lot of, of legal teams they have a lot of, of red tape they have to work through but on youtube i'm just you know i'm sitting here chatting with you i'm in my bedroom in atlanta georgia you know and so i think that <laughs> helps people see you're not an actor you're no not, you know, this is this can happen to any any person yeah. and, and i've said this before and i'll say it again i feel like because I'm, I'm obsessed with studying cults too, like all cults. I just think it's hu the human, human beings are fascinating in the way that they'll, you know, look at Heaven's Gate, like all these things. And it seems like the, the common thread within all these groups, whether it's spirituality, religion, whether it's a self-help group, is it's taking the best of people, the most beautiful parts of a human being, the empathy, the, the idealism, the wanting to make the leave the world a better place than how they found it. It's taking that and then manipulating it. And so, um, and so I want for anybody like who is coming out of one of these groups, I know my friend Kelly Teal has talked about with the Nexium stuff, being embarrassed. And I was like, why? Oh no, completely. I I can relate to that one hundred percent. And also the the forgiveness. It's really hard. Like even for me, I was born into it. There's still things that I don't, I, you know, I'm trying, I'm working through it, but I can't, you know, it still hits me. Like I did, you know, I, I did an interview with Shalice Sola at Cults to Consciousness and it just kind of comes out of nowhere. Like, like, oh, well, I promise, I promise I'm working on it. I promise I'm trying and I'm it's gonna... not, it's, it's just, it's just really hard, you know, and I, I but there is a part of me that knows that that's just part of the trauma and i know that a different path would have led a different place and i'm i completely accept where i am now i completely you know i it's not that everything i lived through happened for a reason it's just more of you know i am who i am despite what i've lived through is more more prefer my preferred approach <laughs> <laughs> well, and you've got such a here, guys. I'm I'm a huge fan. I told Claire I have reached out to Shalice because I am a huge fan of her um of her her podcast. And here are the two episodes, guys. I will put this in the description box below um, of Claire on Cults to Consciousness because well, and I'm going to tell you, I I told this to Kelly. I was like, for from an outsider looking in, um, you guys have nothing to be embarrassed about because 
for me, looking at you, looking at my friend Kelly, looking at all y'all, as we say in the South, all y'all who you're beautiful human beings. And you can see it in your eyes that you just want, you were going to, you were trying to clear the planet, Claire, like you were taking <laughs> on the burden of yep. all of humanity, Yeah. regardless of whether that's bunk or true in your heart and in your intention, you were trying to save humanity. Right. And that's admirable. Yeah. And, and we were just, we were just woefully misinformed and uh, in my case anyway, indoctrinated from a very young age. Yeah. But I was talking to my, one of my oldest friends recently and we were kind of comparing notes. Like he grew up in the, the same environment I did in England in the cadet organization. He was born into the SEER organization and we were kind of like comparing notes. Like, well, what, what do you think? I, you know, how do how do we rationalize like where we came from and where we are now and to me we kind of agreed it's it's kind of there's two elements obviously we consider ourselves survivors and you know we we lived through what we lived through and we've fought to get to where we are now but also i i think a, a piece an element of it is kind of the catalyst of breaking away from that controlling abusive organization and taking back your right to live your right to believe in what you want to believe in and your right to make your own choices about your life path and i think that's you know both of those are elements at least for me personally <laughs> and that's an, now you get to love how you want to love and so for anybody that's coming from a high controlled group it's there's no judgment like i promise you most people aren't i know i said this in our first episode and i, I think you know when you look at cults like scientology or nexium where there's a lot of sensationalism right there's a lot of um with the xenu stuff or with the nexium with the branding like there's there's there, it catches people eye, people's eye because it's sensational but once you've heard the story, you've heard the story. But what keeps people coming back is the resilience of of you guys, the resilience of of you guys. And and, and Catherine and I have talked about this a lot. Catherine Edwards and I. Catherine will be releasing that episode soon, guys, with Claire. How unbelievable we were talking about it today with you and Amy Scoby about how off air, how like we we listen to your stories. And so many people out in the, the normie world will go through something and they, they feel like they're victims, but they have, they still have support. And it's y'all, y'all story. Like you're leaving with literally nothing like, right. nothing. and, and the fact that you're able to then be a functioning member of society. And not only that, not only thrive in society, but open up a YouTube channel and like give the middle finger. <laughs> I mean, that, there's Hi, no, Osa. <laughs> we had one comment that that when I was catching it, it was obviously like, and before I even had a chance to like delete it, I looked at all the responses and I'm like, I'm just gonna leave this up because everybody <laughs> was like calling this person out, like literally. And that's the, that we can laugh about that because like, lol, Scientology, like you're wasting a lot of money creating these. We know these people are not guilty of what you're accusing them of. Like, yeah. you're lying to yourselves if you think yeah. you're going to, like, dissuade anybody because tr the truth resonates. People know they recognize the truth. And yes. they see the truth in you guys. And you all have the same stories. And there's a sincerity coming from you. And I've heard all of you say, and I, I guess we're, we're coming up on an hour now, guys. But I do, I know I had a lot of emails that were, I was telling Claire, I think off air, maybe we talked a little bit about it on where people want us to get into like the details of the bridge and the money. Holy shit, you guys. Like <laughs> <laughs> Brace yourselves for that episode. <laughs> I mean, like they, they obviously the CR got popular because who can afford that shit? Like I'm I, I so I, I want to get into that too, because to me that's an issue. Cause and I've heard you guys say many times, and I agree with you, doesn't matter what you believe. And listen, there are a lot of religions that believe in extraterrestrial life. So the whole Xenu thing, I know people like to laugh about it. It's funny. But there are a lot of faiths that talk about extraterrestrial. I mean, our United States government's just mentioned that alien life is real and nobody even gives a shit. People are like, cool. <laughs> okay. That's going to work now. <laughs> like, you know? So like, it, that stuff doesn't, I don't think people really care what you believe. What people care about is how you treat others and what you do in the world. And 
And so that's not the problem with, with, yeah. with Scientology. It's not the belief system. That's the, really the pro it's, it's the way that they behave in the way that, and the, and the, I don't want to, I really want to, cause I feel like that's financial abuse. What they're doing is financial abuse. Oh yeah. Um, which is another form. And I will give you guys to, to kind of a teaser for the next episode. I will tell you the school that I go to in India that I was authorized through is one of the most in demand schools in India. It's the hard, one of the hardest schools to get into. It's the pa Parm guru, which is like the head of this particular lineage is my teacher. The tuition, now this is a for-profit school, an actual poor for-profit school. My tuition for a month, for a full month of all my classes is only $500. Wow. That would probably buy you, what, like two courses? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe an hour of counseling, you know? <laughs> but mind you, you, ha you can't just buy an hour. You have to buy 12 and a half hours. <laughs> you wild to me. I'm like... <laughs> I mean, this is a non-profit guy it's like the school in india is a for-profit like they're there to make a profit and give you your education and you go and then you teach and you make a it's a full it's a school scientology wow. is a non-profit like I, and i have a problem with the christian church but i don't know many people are having to pay to go to sunday school yeah we'll have to pull up a uh, pu pull up a recent price list and go through and we can talk about you know it, it might be a few episodes, but it would be I, fun I for sure. This is where I start going, this shit is not a religion, IRS. This yep. is a for-profit business. Yep. It's fucking ridiculous. People are paying more than they do for their university. I laugh because it makes me uncomfortable because it's fucking much money. Like I know. And they know. can't even pay their Sea Org. I mean, they can't even pay these people like a proper wage when right. they're making, I mean, it's... Now I'm, we'll, we'll get into it with the next episode because I got a lot of questions about that. And I, and I told you before we filmed that, it's a, a whole episode on its own. And guys, I'm going to encourage you to, if you have any more questions about us, Claire did send me some of the PDFs that I'm going through currently. Um, so I don't have to give them any more money. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> One less dollar size. Home. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we can go through and comb through. And I did reach out to some of my colleagues to also who volunteered, who said they would also look through it as well and start to find. So if you guys have any more theology questions where you want to hear the counter argument from like Eastern philosophy, please just email esotericatlanta at gmail.com. Again, if you're, if you, um, if you are somebody that's coming or hidden from Scientology or kind of quietly, I can leave everything anonymous. It's no big deal. I totally understand. So, so please uh, make sure that you reach out for any, any questions you have, you have that you want answered. And um, again, make sure guys, make sure you go and subscribe to Claire and Mark's channel. I'm obsessed with your Shelly Miscavige series. I get so excited when I see a new one drop. I'm like, I'm going to Nancy Drew this. <laughs> oh, nice. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I know I've been a little bit slacking last week. We had some technical issues, but we have so much great stuff coming. And I will go ahead and say somebody suggested, and I'm going to do it, that when I do come to wrapping up this whole series, I'm going to do a whole series of where is Guillaume LeServe? Where is Mark Ingber? Where is Mark Yeager? Like all these other missing Scientology executives that have not been been seen in public because it's Shelly just epitomizes the issue here. So you anyway, tip of the pyramid. Well, that's the whole thing. The whole we haven't even talked about the whole, which we can do that's a whole right. episode on too. Now, something I didn't ask you, Claire, but I'm assuming this is going to be okay. Um, I like to do giveaways on this channel and yes. I'm going to esoteric Atlanta. The channel is going to, I want to pay for two, cause I know that your proceeds go to the aftermath foundation. I'm going to, for two people in the comment section below, put blown for good. And I'm going to make sure that you get a book from Claire and Mark. I will be the one to make sure that you get that. And, and, you know, check out their SP shop. I want to get a bracelet myself. <laughs> yes. I, okay. So I will send you a bracelet as a thank you for having me oh. on. So just oh. tell me what size you want. And we can, we can do a, a signed book giveaway and also team Mike, Mike Rinder bobblehead. Yeah. Yeah, guys. And I actually, I, I kind of, I didn't want to, I know Mike Rinder's struggling with, with um, some health issues now, but he is such an incredible human being as you guys, you all are. So, so guys put that in the comment section below. 
I will announce it. The next episode Claire and I do together will announce the winners um, because this is a very important story and it's a very important cause. And once again, I'm going to put the website for the Aftermath Foundation in the description box below too so that you can also make an independent donation or volunteer, whatever it is you feel like you can do to help your fellow humans. My favorite Ram Dass quote, quote, we are all just walking each other home. That's all we're doing is we're walking each other home. So hopefully David Miscavige is going to a different home. <laughs> <laughs> he's not He's not coming to my home, that's for with sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stop and pick Shelly up on the way, but he's not coming with us. <laughs> Shelly's fine. She can come. Not David. <laughs> not David. So, oh, man, I would hate to be David Miscavige right now. He's got a whole world of her coming for him. I just feel that. Oh, like- yes. You know, as Mark <laughs> likes to say, sucks to suck, David Miscavige. <laughs> I mean, you you can't get away with this shit forever. And he keeps dodging those servers, which is so... And the least you can do, David Miscavige, is suck up and be a fucking man and take those papers. You yep. look like a little boy, yep. right? Like your child. So uh, so that's coming from... And, and, and even that, I'd say children would do better. So oh, no offense to children either. <laughs> scum on a pond surface would do better than that exactly there we go you you are not the poster child for humanity at this point so no um, so anyway there's a special place in hell for people like him so anyway you guys well thank you so much claire i just you're just such a delightful person i I could just chat (laughs) chat to you forever i just think you're just so awesome and i have so much respect for you and um just everything that you and mark are doing and all of you guys you are really making a huge impact on humanity and and it's it's an honor having you on this channel and i thank you so much and i can't wait to get you back thank you so very much i appreciate your time too all right guys everything will be in the description box we'll talk to you soon bye everybody bye Thank you.